Decision 2002, control of Congress and state houses up for grabs. The tight races, the voters, the key players, lots at stake. Making the call. The news media got it wrong last time tonight. The people who do the predicting say one of their crucial tools is unreliable. It could be a very long night. Strong medicine, universal health care on the ballot in Oregon. Coverage for everyone, but at what cost? And three strikes. Are these harsh laws cruel and unusual? The Supreme Court struggles with a case that could have a big impact on criminal justice. From NBC News, this is NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Reporting tonight from Washington. Good evening from the nation's capital. Whatever your political belief, however angry you may be over modern campaign tactics and the choices before you, Election Day in the world's most powerful democracy remains an astonishing accomplishment. And after almost a billion dollars in broadcast ads alone, debates, dropouts, and deaths, a president who all but went door-to-door -door campaigning, the outcome tonight could be so evenly divided, you could be hearing the phrase, a 50-50 nation for the next two years. This is where voters are likely to have their greatest impact. It's the U.S. Senate. Does it stay in the hands of Democrats with their very narrow margin with the help of one of those two independents? While in the House, Republicans hope to protect or even add to their slim margin there. We're covering all of that tonight and all the ramifications of this election night, 2002. We're going to begin with NBC's Lisa Myers. Lisa? Tom, tonight Republicans are confident they will maintain control of the House. The Senate remains excruciatingly close, but Majority Leader Tom Daschle predicts Democrats will keep control. Today, as Americans finally cast their votes, long lines were reported in some parts of the country. Both parties operated national hotlines for voters to report any problems. Yeah, and listen, the, the idea here is everyone stays and votes. If there's a yes. question, let's have a conditional ballot. Uh, we can, you know, we can resolve it tomorrow. Mostly, callers reported the usual election day snafus. I think everybody was expecting a really big nightmare. It hasn't been as bad as I expected. In Raleigh, North Carolina, workers found themselves locked out of the polling place, so set up their tables outside. In Georgia, some new electronic machines apparently malfunctioned. In Knox County, Tennessee, the polls opened at 8 a.m., but the ballots didn't show up till 9.30. And Lord knows it's on TV every five minutes that you'd think they'd be prepared for paper. In the Senate, Republicans are most worried about seats in Arkansas, where polls showed Senator Tim Hutchinson trailing badly. Colorado, where Senator Wayne Allard needs a strong ground game. New Hampshire, where polls showed John Sununu in a dead heat. Democrats are most worried about Missouri, where Senator Jean Carnahan predicted a Missouri surprise. She trails in most polls. South Dakota, where Senator Tim Johnson is in a dogfight. Minnesota, where former Vice President Walter Mondale is counting on a huge turnout. All eyes also are on Louisiana, where Democratic Senator Mary Landrieu needs to capture 50 percent of the vote or face a runoff next month. Democrats worried that tornado warnings this morning could hurt their turnout. Tonight, both parties have planes and volunteers standing by to go to Louisiana if that race becomes a runoff and control of the Senate hangs in the balance. Tom. Thanks very much, NBC's Lisa Myers tonight. And joining me now once again with his high-tech assistance, where things stand on this election day, NBC's Washington Bureau Chief Moderator of Meet the Press, Tim Russert. Tim, we're talking about the U.S. Senate here and where it ends up. Tom, we sure are. As Lisa talked about, the Republicans are most concerned about Arkansas, Colorado, New Hampshire, North Carolina. Say, for example, the Democrats capture Arkansas and Colorado. Democrats concerned about Minnesota, Missouri, Georgia, South Dakota. Say the Republicans capture Minnesota, Missouri. People say, okay, status quo. They won two, they lost two. Democrats still in charge. Not so fast. Louisiana. Unless the Democratic candidate gets 50% of the vote today, there will be a runoff on December 7th. If the Republicans won that runoff, there would be 50 Republicans, 50 Democrats. Dick Cheney, the vice president, would cast his vote for Trent Lott, the Republicans' majority leader. The Democrats need to have a plus one victory tonight, a gain of a seat, to avoid having risk at all in Louisiana a month from now if the Democrat doesn't get 50% of the vote tonight. And the same is true for the Republicans. They've got to get a plus two in this case. Absolutely. If they want to put this away, they have to do some r 
a double hit here, win Minnesota, Missouri, and hold on to these four vulnerable states. This is going to be a long night, a long week. It could be a long month. Old-fashioned politics once again in America. Nothing like it. And everything is up for grabs, Tom. And these candidates, you talk to them all day long, they don't have a clue who's going to win. Uh, we talked to the White House today, we talked to the Democratic side, we talked to the Republican side, and that's the interesting part. But generally, at this stage, on an election day, one of those parties will say it's going to be okay for us. They see a trend. It's coming our way. It's going against the Democrats, for the Republicans or vice versa. Every state is unique. And the other thing that's interesting is that no one issue is cutting across the board. You can't find it. The economy, Iraq, the war on terrorism. Each of these candidates seems to have their own relationship with the voters in any particular state. Democrats win some place, Republicans some other place. Is there a pattern to where the president visited? We will not know for some time. All right. Tim Russett, you will be side by side for a long, long night. The candidates, of course, are not the only key players with a lot at stake tonight. The president has put a lot of time and his personal political capital into this campaign. NBC's Campbell Brown now live at the White House with the latest from there. Campbell. Tom, the president is settling in for a long night of watching returns. Top Republican leaders are joining him here tonight, and they are publicly insisting they have a strong shot at taking back the Senate. At the firehouse in Crawford, Texas, the president and Mrs. Bush cast their votes and schmooze the locals. I'm supposed to go to your birthday party? <laughs> Having raised a record more than $140 million for Republican candidates relentlessly campaigning on their behalf, today the president tempered his message for all Americans. All people vote. Encouraging all people across this country to vote. Shouted questions from reporters were ignored. A day so crucial, the president careful to avoid comment on anything controversial. In South Dakota, Bush's chief rival for control of the agenda worked to rally his own party base. Senate Democratic leader Tom Daschle has been quietly flirting with a presidential bid in 2004. But if Republicans gain just one Senate seat, those hopes may be dampened, Daschle losing his title Senate Majority Leader to Republican Trent Lott. Pretty day out there. The stakes are just as high for House Minority Leader Dick Gephardt. More up front about his presidential ambitions, Gephardt could become Speaker of the House and strongly position himself to challenge President Bush if Democrats surprise experts and take back control of the House, meaning a gain of more than six seats. Now, aides say the president won't stay up all night watching returns, but he will likely wait for the outcome of Brother Jeb's uh, re-election bid for governor down in Florida, then call it a night and see what the morning brings. Tom? All right. Thanks very much, NBC's Campbell Brown tonight. One of the most closely watched races in the nation is the race for Senate in Minnesota, where former Vice President Walter Mondale became an unexpected contender after the sudden death of Democratic incumbent Paul Wellstone less than two weeks ago. Mondale and his opponent, Republican Norm Coleman, kept campaigning even after the polls opened this morning. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell is on the ground in St. Paul for us tonight. Kelly? Good evening, Tom. Tonight, Minnesota officials tracking down complaints that some polling places didn't have or ran out of the reprinted ballots for this Mondale-Coleman race. And what has been the shortest Senate campaign may well be the longest election night. Thank you, thank you. Maybe the only time a long line is a good sign. Voter turnout. Walter Mondale waiting 30 minutes this morning and 18 years to vote for himself one last time. This is the largest turnout they've ever had at this time of the morning. So it tells me that there's tremendous interest in this election. So much at stake, both parties dispatched an estimated 3,000 poll watchers to make sure the process works fairly. My mother is an absentee voter judge, and so she's been going to training all weekend long to learn about how to count the ballots. Tonight, every U.S. Senate vote in Minnesota's 4,100 precincts will be counted by hand. 30,000 election judges in charge of 3 million ballots. Today, Republican Norm Coleman making his last telephone pitch. Yes, uh, Bill, hi, this is Norm Coleman. An extraordinary race. And tonight's hand count making for a slow motion finish. That could be unnerving. This could be a very long, long evening. Because so many absentee voters received ballots with Wellstone's name, they were given a chance to re vote today in person. So no absentee ballots will be counted until after polls close. Another delay. Tom? Thanks very much. Uh, NBC's Kelly O'Donnell tonight in Minnesota. In the other corner of the country, Florida, still struggling to get it right after the crisis and chaos of the last two elections in that state. 
How are things going there tonight? For that, we turn to NBC's Kerry Sanders, who's in Miami. Kerry? Well, Tom, here in Florida, an unprecedented effort to get it right appears to have paid off. After spending more than $50 million, today, Florida's vote system looked like most any other across the country. Polls opened on time. And in Florida, that was the first good sign. The overhauled voting system here seems to be finally working. But after initial cheers, isolated problems began to emerge. In Jacksonville, voters in one precinct found the scanners that read the marked ballots failed. It's very upsetting because you want to cast your vote. And I've, I've studied my ballot and I've studied the candidates. And here I'm ready to do it and nobody else is ready. In South Florida, where the new touchscreen computers replaced the old punch card ballots that failed so miserably in 2000, some voters complained when they touched the screen to select Democrat Bill McBride for governor, the system instead put a check mark next to Republican Jeb Bush. I redid it, and it came up on the uh, wrong candidate the second time. I went through that maybe uh, 10 or 12 times before the machine actually took the right vote. Elections officials call the glitches today routine, and independent monitors from Russia and Albania and the Center for Democracy agreed. Having been the poster child for the problems, it now be, may become the poster child for the solution to these problems. Now, elections officials here in Florida say those voters that ran into those handful of problems can rest assured their votes will be counted. There are fail-safe systems designed, they say, to include them all in the final vote tabulations. Tom? Thanks very much, NBC's Kerry Sanders tonight in Florida. Still ahead, our coverage of Decision 2002 continues a major development. One of the biggest tools to predict and analyze the voting tonight is being called, quote, unreliable. What now? Later... A shoplifter locked up for 50 to life. Is that fair? The Supreme Court debates three strikes and you're up. MSNBC has the best election team in the business, led by number one political insider Chris Matthews. Decision 2002, hardball style on MSNBC. NBC News in depth tonight. Remember election night 2000? We certainly do. The memory still haunts. The lingering image, the chaos of getting it wrong twice with lots of help. Lots of changes have been made between then and now to ensure the accuracy of election predictions. But late today, a stunning announcement that threatened to turn everything upside down again. Here's NBC's Brian Williams with the latest for us. Brian, what's going on there? Well, Tom, here we are in NBC News polling headquarters. And remember how you and I were going to be talking about exit polling tonight? Well, not so fast. We knew tonight was going to be different because of what happened last time around. We did not know it was going to be this different. But tonight, because of an abundance of caution and some computing problems, we now know this is going to be a very late night. No one who watched it or participated in it will ever forget election night 2000. We are projecting that when all the votes are counted, the state of Florida will go tonight to the vice president, Mr. Gore. So we have a change in our call. Florida is now too close to call. We don't just have egg in our face, we've got omelet all over our suits. On a night when accuracy is crucial, the news media got it wrong. And as a result, Decision 2002 was going to be done differently from top to bottom. There were hearings in Congress on what went wrong on election night. News executives were called to testify. Twelve million dollars was spent to revamp the consortium of news organizations called VNS, the folks who combined the raw numbers with exit polling to come out with election night projections. Then tonight came a statement from VNS saying that it is not satisfied with the accuracy of today's exit poll analysis. That means those watching tonight will instead be hearing actual returns, the raw vote. NBC News will also use a poll of likely voters conducted right up until Election Day as a way of looking at why people are voting the way they are voting tonight. 
And so, aside from what we learned from the Voter News Service, what will we have tonight? Well, we will know voter attitudes. Again, we know that by telephone surveys taken right up until the vote, we will have, of course, the raw vote. And you will see projections on our network tonight. They will be in what one analyst called the solid slam dunk elections where the numeric vote is comfortable. I asked our polling director earlier, does this mean we've gone back to 1950? this evening. He paused and said, no, it's more like we're using mid-1960s technology tonight. And so, to sum up, if you liked Johnson Goldwater, you'll love this evening. The advantage is NBC News plans to televise in color tonight. Tom? Thanks very much, NBC's Brian Williams. An old-fashioned night tonight brought up to the year 2002. When does tough sentencing become cruel and inhuman punishment? The Supreme Court will decide that. And then, is universal health care a good idea? It's on the ballot in Oregon. In other news tonight, the Bush administration is expected to submit its new last chance resolution on Iraq to the UN Security Council tomorrow morning. The text has been changed after negotiations with France, Russia, and other critics that objected to the United States threatening war if Iraq refuses to disarm. And the Israeli government is in turmoil tonight. Prime Minister Ariel Sharon is dissolving parliament and announcing early elections. Sharon was unable to build his government after his fragile coalition collapsed last week. His toughest challenge will most likely come from within his own right-wing Likud party, from former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, to, who today became the foreign minister of Israel. In Washington, the Supreme Court is tackling questions about crime and punishment. It heard arguments today about whether California's three strikes and your outlaw is sometimes too cruel. Here's NBC's Justice Department correspondent, Pete Williams. After stealing $150 worth of videos from Kmart in Southern California, Leandro Andrade was charged under the state's tough three strikes law because he'd been convicted of burglary twice before. Even though he had no history of violent crime, his sentence was a harsh one, 50 years to life. His lawyer says that's unconstitutional, cruel, and unusual punishment. If any sentence is grossly disproportionate, it's a sentence of 50 years to life for shoplifting a small amount of videotapes. In another case, repeat offender Gary Ewing caught stealing three golf clubs from this pro shop by stuffing them down his pants leg got 25 years to life. Lawyers for both men today urge the Supreme Court to strike down the part of California's law that allows prosecutors to count a nonviolent crime like shoplifting as the critical third strike. Justice Breyer seemed sympathetic, noting that only a murderer or hijacker would get such a harsh sentence. But Justice Scalia said the law is intended to get a small number of people who commit a high percentage of crimes off the streets. And Chief Justice Rehnquist asked, why can't California decide that enough is enough? About half the states have some kind of three strikes law. California's was passed following public outrage that 12-year-old Polly Class was murdered by a convicted kidnapper out on parole. Prosecutors say the law helps reduce crime. It's a street-sweeping statute because we can remove these individuals from society from preying on people. Based on their questions today, the justices seem inclined to uphold California's three strikes law and find it within the state's power to harshly punish those who can't stop committing crimes. Pete Williams, NBC News at the Supreme Court. On Wall Street, it was a slow day until an afternoon rally sent the blue chip stocks climbing. Investors seem confident of another interest rate cut tomorrow when the Federal Reserve meets. The Dow, as a result, was up almost 107 points. NASDAQ gained four and a half points on the day. I'll be back with more after this. In several states across the country, voters are making decisions on important local issues. In Oregon, one is called free health care. But is it? Here's NBC's Roger O'Neill. If it sounds too good to be true, the saying goes... The best vote you can ever make in, in Oregon history. Then Oregon voters will decide if universal free health care is free. Uh, have you heard about Measure 23? Measure 23, a citizen initiative for cradle-to-grave health care. No premiums, no co-pays. Every resident covered, all costs paid. Doctors, drugs, even acupuncture. Yeah, I had some of those numbers. I was the Yes buy. campaign run out of a car by two 22-year-olds uh, with not, cell phones. You know, we Dan Isaacson. So, you know, we're polling um, better with Democrats and we're polling better with, uh, with women. 
Britt McCarran. This system costs too much, it covers too little, and it leaves too many people out. We have to change something. With insurance companies raising premiums, with co-pays for prescription drugs going up all the time, with HMOs telling doctors they can't use the stethoscope on some people anymore and be paid for it, you'd think the industry would welcome the spotlight on universal health care. But Oregon's big three health insurers are pouring money into the campaign against. A state-run health care plan would put them out of business. But they add Oregon could go bankrupt too, since the devil is in the details, spelled T-A-X-E-S. More payroll taxes on business, more taxes on personal income, as much as 25000 for top wage earners. Even with that, one industry study projects a $3.5 billion shortfall. All of us would be encouraged to use more because we have no economic incentive not to. For the underinsured like Teresa Camarina, universal care is the right prescription. But as people mark their ballots in Oregon, polls show Measure 23 slipping. This dose of medicine apparently too strong for what most agree is an ailing patient. Roger O'Neill, NBC News, Eugene, Oregon. A reminder, we'll have special election coverage throughout the night on NBC, a special beginning at 10 Eastern Time. Remember, MSNBC, CNBC, and MSNBC.com. That's Nightly News for right now. I'm Tom Brokaw. I'll see you later this evening. Good evening, I'm Norman Robinson. And I'm Chris Fairbairn. Just a reminder, you can see your election returns at the bottom of your screen. Also, we're keeping an eye on the race for Senate and the race for Orleans Parish DA. Join us for a live update within the next few minutes. So far, so far, all the Republicans who are expected to go back to the United States Senate have returned. Same is true for the Democrats, but the critical races are still outstanding. We want to begin tonight, however, in the state of Florida, where there's been a big sigh of relief at the governor's mansion and at the White House. NBC News is projecting that the president's brother, Jeb Bush, has been reelected governor of Florida. That means the Republicans will hold that state. The president spent 12 different visits down there raising money and campaigning for his little brother. And tonight, Jeb Bush is winning by a very comfortable margin in that state during the course of the next hour. We do expect to be talking to him. On the United States Senate side, let's begin with the Democrats. Frank Lautenberg, the winner in New Jersey, replacing Robert Torricelli on the ballot in a controversial decision, but he goes back to the United States Senate after being gone for one term. John Kerry, the winner in Massachusetts, big presidential ambitions in that office. Also in the United States Senate on the Democratic side, from Delaware, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Joe Biden, will be going back. In West Virginia, Jay Rockefeller, no surprise there, another Democrat reelected. In Michigan, Carl Levin, another Democrat going back to the United States Senate. Richard Durbin in Illinois, our projected winner, a member of the Senate Democratic leadership, and Max Baucus in the state of Montana, the projected winner. So the Democrats so far have returned to the United States Senate all those that they needed to get back to hold on to their very slim majority. But there are outstanding races still to be counted here tonight. We're going to go to Sioux Falls, South Dakota now, and the Senate Majority Leader, Tom Daschle, who hopes by tomorrow at this time he'll still have that title. Senator, we're down to the political equivalent of a two-minute drill. What are your best hopes now in the closing hours of this election night? Well, Tom, our best hopes are, of course, first to win those uh, contested seats where we've had a very close race, South Dakota, Missouri, Minnesota. Uh, we also think we've got a real good chance in Arkansas and Colorado. There may be other surprises, but those are the ones we're watching right now. So far, it appears that uh, Libby Dole, for example, in North Carolina is going to win that race. A uh, fair number of the raw voters in. Have you given up on that one? Well, we haven't given up on it. No, the, the, we don't have enough vote in to, to be confident about that. Same with Georgia. We think we've got a real good chance yet in Georgia. A lot of the, uh, the precincts that favor uh, uh, Senator Cleland uh, haven't been reported in yet. So uh, we think we've got a real good shot there. We're watching that one closely as well. A lot of Democrats, as well as neutral observers, are wondering why the Democrats could not take more advantage of voter concern over the economy, health care, and education, especially in an off-year election, when traditionally the political power in the White House loses seats in the Congress. It seems unlikely tonight that the president will lose very much power in this Congress. 
Well, Tom, I think, of course, the, 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 the country was consumed by the issue of Iraq and uh, the debate about the Iraqi resolution and what would happen. And then, of course, North Korea came along. Uh, but I do believe that uh, the economy was one of the most critical questions. There is a great deal of concern, in fact, anxiety about the economy, and that was reflected in the vote in many of the, uh, the, the states uh, around the country. As we uh, now talk to voters and as we've talked to the candidates who have been involved in these campaigns, no question the economy was a big issue. However this turns out tonight, it appears that either the Democrats or the Republicans will have a very narrow margin of control in the Senate and the House. Do we expect deadlock for the next two years? Not at all. I don't think we have to see deadlock, Tom. I think that uh, we knew going in that this was going to be a close race, and we knew coming out that it would probably stay close in the House and in the Senate, regardless of who would have control. Uh, now what we've got to do is to put all that behind us and try to find ways to work together. We did it on occasion in the Senate in the 107th Congress. I have no doubt that we can do it again in the 108th. What's going to happen in South Dakota before the night is out? I think Tim Johnson's uh, going to win. He's ahead in the early uh, reporting, but it's way too early to tell. We're, we're hopeful he'll win. It looks like uh, that's the way it's going at this point, and we're quite optimistic. All right, thanks very much, Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle tonight in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Now to the Republicans who are going back to the United States Senate. No major surprises here. There were some concerns. We'll talk about those in a moment. In the Rocky Mountain West, Mike Enzi is going back. He's a Republican senator for a second term. Pete Domenici, one of the old war horses of the Republican Party, returning from New Mexico. In Nebraska, Chuck Hagel, a rising power in the United States Senate, going back for a second term. In Kansas, Pat Roberts, also re-elected as a Republican senator. Thad, uh, in Oklahoma, James Inhofe is the winner in Oklahoma, re-elected a national security expert. In Mississippi, it's Thad Cochran, who will be returning to the United States Senate. Uh, Susan Collins, one of the women in the United States Senate from the state of Maine. Down to the Deep South now to Alabama, Jeff Sessions, re-elected to the United States Senate. John Warner, one of the veteran members of that chamber, re-elected from the Old Dominion in the state of Virginia. And Mitch McConnell from Kentucky, one of the bulldogs on the Republican side, a man who fiercely fought the idea of campaign finance reform, also re-elected to the United States Senate. Someone who's been watching all of this with great care tonight is former Republican presidential candidate John McCain, who joins us now, fresh from his stint as the host of Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Senator, based on what we're seeing tonight, the country is evenly divided. Is it more center than the partisan barking, uh, uh, the partisan bickering would reflect here in Washington? I think so, Tom, but I, I also think we detect a Republican breeze, not a gale, but a breeze here. Uh, we've done better in the House races than many had anticipated. Uh, I think we will either have 50-50 or a one-vote majority. and. Uh, uh, you've got to give uh, a lot of credit to the President of the United States who campaigned uh, frenetically uh, and uh, he may have in these close races been uh, had a lot to do with uh, with some of the victories and some of the you know everybody expected a close race in in North Carolina that didn't happen and so uh, I think there's a bit of a Republican breeze here and part of it has to be because of the popularity of the president. And how does the president use that Republican breeze as you describe it to his advantage in the next two years? Well, as, as, as was pointed out, uh, we've been in virtual gridlock on everything from homeland security to prescription drugs to others. Uh, the American people deserve, deserve better. I think they want better. And I hope that uh, the president's agenda will be now to, to have a real bipartisan approach to, to some of these issues. These issues, some of these issues should not be uh, a partisan issues. And I hope we can, can work these out. Otherwise, I think you're going to see a, a, an independent party in the United States. Do you think there's any chance the president will reconsider the tax cut for those at the top of the income brackets in the next two years? Well, I hope he will, because I think it's uh, lower income Americans that are suffering the most uh, in this economic downturn. I'd like to see one of the first priorities to be a payroll tax cut. There's so many Americans that that's the only tax they pay, and, uh, and some Americans are hurting. Uh, unemployment is up. Uh, but I also believe we need to do other things to stimulate the economy in the form of tax reductions as well. Senator, you raised the rise of the Independent Party. A number of people around the country are wondering whether you will be tempted to step into that side of American politics and run for president the next time as an independent? No, but, but uh, I, I do say this, that uh, every reliable pollster I know says that unless one or both the parties move to the center, 
that you will see an independent party uh, come to the fore in American politics. And uh, I, I just believe that, and I talk to too many people that are frustrated with the gridlock they see. And, and frankly, this, this gridlock by the money and the special interest, some of it will be broken now that campaign finance reform law will take effect as of tomorrow, or midnight tonight. Well, I don't want to play the part of the Tim Russell mm -hmm. caricature on Saturday Night Live, but is that a Sherman-like statement? Are you not running? I cannot envision a scenario. Thank you very much, Senator John McCain of Arizona. Thanks, tonight. Tom. Well, Tim, <laughs> we're going to call the United States uh, Senate race now in Tennessee before we get to this. Uh, Lamar Alexander is going back. He had presidential aspirations. He's the former governor of that state as well, and uh, he's a son of uh, Tennessee for a long, long time. College roommate of Paul Tagliabue, the commissioner of the National Football League. So no surprise there, Tim. Well, we've been talking about this all night long. We still come down to these races. We sure do, Tom. He called the, the easy ones, and now it comes down to the crunch. Eight key races. The Republicans are trying to hold on to Arkansas, Colorado, New Hampshire, North Carolina. If, in fact, North Carolina goes to Elizabeth Dole as being suggested by the raw vote, they have successfully held off a very tough fight. The Democrats are concerned about Minnesota, Missouri, Georgia, South Dakota. What happens if the Democrats win Arkansas and Colorado? What happens then if the Republicans counter by winning Minnesota and Missouri? People say, well, even split, the Democrats stay in control. Not so fast, because the Democratic candidate in Louisiana, Mary Landrieu, must get 50% of the vote in a four-way race tonight. Otherwise, there's a runoff on December 7th. If she would to lose that, Dick Cheney, as president of the Senate, would vote for Trent Lott as majority leader. It may not come to that, but I don't think we're going to know until tomorrow morning what has happened in Minnesota, Missouri, perhaps even Georgia. The control of the Senate is still in the balance. And that's a very, very big story tonight because uh, judges will be sent to the Senate by the White House. Uh, we have the Homeland Security Bill, whole economic reform program that may or may not happen as a result of what happens in those particular states. Tax cuts and more, and people will be measuring George Bush's performance, his first midterm election, against other presidents in history. If he holds the House and also retakes the Senate or comes close, it'll be a very historic it, evening. It will be a historic evening. Only, uh, it will be only the third time since the Civil War, in fact, that a president of a party in power has in fact gained in the House of Representatives. Let's go to uh, NBC's Brian Williams now, who's keeping track of polling data for us, but also the many races for governor, 36 around the country, Brian. That's right, Tom, and here in New York, we are tracking the following. The Taft hold on GOP politics in Ohio continues tonight. Governor Bob Taft, the Republican, a second term there. Colorado Bill Owens, who came to prominence after Columbine for a horrible reason, said to harbor some national ambitions, perhaps. Mike Johans in Nebraska. The land of steady habits, Connecticut, returns John Rowland to the State House tonight. Craig Benson in New Hampshire, that's the State House vacated by Gene Shaheen. Kenny Gwynn, the favored candidate in Nevada tonight. The gregarious former mayor of Philly, Ed Rendell, the projected winner governor's seat in Pennsylvania. The Democrats break a 30-year drought in Illinois. Rod Blagojevich is the next governor there. And in New Mexico, first all-Hispanic gubernatorial race in 80 years in this country. A former Clinton official, Bill Richardson, one of four of them on ballots around the country tonight. Tom, that's it from New York. For now, back to you. Thanks very much, NBC's Brian Williams tonight. Now we're going to have the unusual situation of two women who were married to presidential candidates serving in the United States Senate while their husbands right. find First other things all, to do. There is one of them, husband, Elizabeth Bob Dole, our protected winner in North Carolina, introducing her husband, Bob Dole, who spent a lot of time down there campaigning for her. Closed a lot in the closing days, but Elizabeth Dole, who's held almost every cabinet post, head of the Red Cross, goes back to her home state of North Carolina, our projected winner tonight. We'll be back with more on election night right after this. He got darn near close. He did real well. Also, he was on the phone calling all the country. From WDSU News Channel 6, this is a Commitment 2002 special. Good evening, I'm Norman Robinson. And I'm Chris Fairbairn. We want to bring you up to date with the latest numbers in our local elections. In the race for the United States Senate, you can see the numbers there on your screen with 49, with 24 percent of the precincts reporting. Mary Landry leads with 49 percent, followed by Suzanne Hyde Terrell at 25 percent of the count. 
And also John Cooksey with 14% and Tony Perkins following up with 9% at this hour. 24% of the precincts reporting. It has been a busy night around town. Let's first check in with News Channel 6 reporter Scott Simmons, who's live at the Landrew Camp at the Fairmont Hotel. And Scott, what's the mood like there tonight? Well, it's a little festive. It always is right now before we know the outcome of an election. We're at the Fairmont at a pretty big ballroom. They have a band playing, and a lot of people certainly hoping that the Democrats would be able to take this race tonight. But a lot of key Landrew people are already talking about the real possibility they're flirting with a runoff. In fact, upstairs at the Fairmont right now, the incumbent state senator, our senator Mary Landrew, is watching those returns with family and friends. In fact, she says already sounding like she's looking at a December 7th runoff. You know, she's had some criticism from some political pundits that she should have been more aggressive in some of her campaign spots. She says it will be a different story if there's a round two. Well, there's always a possibility. I mean, we always said it would be about 50-50. I mean, we were very hopeful that we could take this in the first. But again, I'm the only candidate in the country that's run against eight opponents, seven uh, Republicans and independents, one other Democrat. And so, you know, if we get anywhere close to 50 percent, we'll consider it a victory. And we... Even the Democrats right here are having a hard time getting a real feel of where this election is going. For example, they've been watching about 100 polls throughout the state. In areas like Lake Charles or Shreveport, where they watch closely, those polls are at 40 to 50 percent. That's good. The problem is that other polls are polling way, way, way lo lower than that. Covering the Suzanne Hike Terrell campaign is Helena Moreno, live in Baton Rouge. Let's join her. Thank you, Scott, and good evening. And yes, the mood here is also pretty tense. Susie Terrell right now is up in one of the rooms here at the Sheridan, and she is perfecting her speech for tonight. She did come down just a few minutes earlier, and she thanked uh, a lot of the people that are here tonight. I don't know how much you can tell, but there is a, pr a pretty good crowd that showed up here at the Sheridan ballroom. Now, someone that would know how uh, Susie is doing right now is her daughter, Julie. Now, Julie, how is your mother holding up right now? She's doing surprisingly very well. She's not very stressed, so I'm really excited, and she's excited, so a lot calmer than everyone thought she would be. And I know that you have been uh, following up a little bit on the polls. What, what, what can you tell me about that, and what does she think about it? There's going to be a runoff. It's going to be my mom and Mary Landrieu, and we're ready for it. Every single one of us, that's what we're expecting. That's what we've been expecting since, I think, August when we were in D.C. interviewing. So she's ready for it. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you. All right. And so bottom line, the crowd is starting to pick up here. But, yes, it is a little bit uh, of a tense situation out here. Everyone, of course, waiting to see what the outcome is. Reporting live in at the Baton Rouge Sheridan, Elena Moreno, WDSU News Channel 6. All right, Elena, thank you. And we'll have an update on the race for Orleans Parish District Attorney when we come back. Welcome back, everyone. And now for a look at the runoff for Orleans Parish DA, a, county, a seat that Harry Connick has held for the past 30 years. Here are the latest results with 53% of the precincts reporting. Eddie Jordan with 51%. Dell Atkins close behind with 49%. And in the race for U.S. Senate now, as you can see, Mary Landry with 27% of the precincts reporting is leading Suzanne Hyde Terrell. 50 to 25 percent. And the other two candidates following behind John Cooksey and also Tony Perkins with 13 percent and 8 percent respectively. That is all for now and we will have another update for you in about 20 minutes. And we'll also continue to run the latest returns at the bottom of your screen throughout the night. We'll see you again in just a bit. Proud parents tonight in the state of Florida. Uh, one of their sons has been reelected governor of that state, the first Republican to be reelected in, uh, in Florida's history. And with a lot of help from another son who is occupying uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. There is Jeb Bush. We do expect to be hearing from him during the course of this hour. He's mightily relieved tonight. The race got to be pretty close. And in fact, in the last 36 hours or so, they thought that McBride, who was his uh, novice Democratic challenger, was closing in on him, but he did well. His brother had 12 different visits down there. He still has a lot of challenges before him in getting class size down and getting the economy straightened out. But there now is uh, the President 41, as they call him within the family, George Bush, who's always a little more nervous about these things than is Barbara Bush, who... Uh, is a little more warrior-like when it comes to politics. We're joined now by a powerful voice in American politics, the conservative commentator Rush Limbaugh. Earlier, John McCain called this a Republican breeze, as we're seeing it so far. Do you think that's a fair characterization? Well, i tell you what's amazing about this. I was looking at the numbers. You have 34 seats up. The Republicans had to maintain 20 
uh, win 20 just to maintain where they are. That's 60 percent that they had to win tonight. Uh, even if they lose a couple, they still have won a majority. I, th I think that this is a, a, a probably not a, a dramatically historical night, but it, it is historical, as you've been talking about all night from the standpoint of how many times something like this has happened since the Civil War. But the amazing thing to me about this is, is the, the two campaigns that were run. I mean, we had throughout the 90s the uh, Democrats saying that they needed to separate themselves from the old Democrats, such as McGovern and Mondale. When they ran into trouble, they went back to those people. The Democratic Leadership Council was set up to establish this new Democrat uh, situation. They talked about building a bridge of the 21st century. And when they got in trouble, where did they go? They had to go way, way back to people who had retired. Their better days are behind them. They, it, 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 if you look at the campaign, who did they send out to help Democrats in trouble? Bill Clinton. You didn't see future presidential candidates on the Democratic side out there trying to, uh, uh, you know, rouse the base. Uh, I don't know. The party didn't have any issues that it reportedly stood for. It was running a fear campaign, telling people they're going to be minus their Social Security and school lunch cuts. It was like the 95 budget bite all over again. But weren't you surprised, given what the voters were saying about their concerns about the economy and health care and education, that the Democrats didn't even make a run at capitalizing on that to say nothing of corporate scandals with the resignation tonight of Harvey Pitt? Uh, they, I think they tried it all throughout the year. I think since September 11th, they've tried issue after issue. They've tried the economy, they've tried any number of things, but they kept walking into closed doors. Nothing that they tried worked. Now, the reason I think this exists is that the Democrats' success in the past has been to demonize a Republican figurehead who is a leader. They got away with that with Newt Gingrich, but they can't demonize George Bush. He has no character deficiencies. He's an honest man. People love him. He seems to have a, a, a very decent way about him. And so all of these threats that the Democrats were promising people, nobody believed them this time around. I think they've got an old playbook. I think they're gonna have to junk it, and they're gonna have to go back and try to give people reasons to vote for them rather than ginning up support or, or opposition to their opponents as their sole means of victory, because it's not working tonight. In a nonpartisan way, all the polls that we saw, and, and from an anecdotal point of view, as I went across the country, everybody complained to me, Republican and Democrat alike, about attack ads and the amount of money that were spent on these campaigns. The people are more interested in finding common ground out there than they seem to be when they get to Washington. Well, I, these, the, uh, you hear this every cycle, that the negative ads are getting worse and people are becoming more and more opposed to them. We heard today we're going to have a record low turnout. Didn't materialize, did it? We had some of the, some places were very high. It's probably going to be a higher turnout than was expected. I mean, it's a sad thing, I guess, in some people's view, but these negative ads work for, for some people. But in this case, the point I want to make about the Democrats is that it's, it's look at, with the economy where it is, it's not the greatest economy in the world, clearly. We all have to admit that. It's not as bad as they've said it was, but it certainly isn't great. This is an off-year election. Tradition says they should pick up 10 seats in the House, 12. This shouldn't even have been a, a, a matter of, of debate tonight. You, you look at what's happened here tonight, it's clear that the, you can chalk it up to whatever you want, negative ads or this. I think the Democrats simply this time didn't give anybody reason to vote for them. And Bush successfully nationalized the race, so they had no national issues to really battle him with. Rush, in 2000, it became clear to people in the country that we're a 50-50 nation, divided between Democrats and Republicans. Since that time, we've had September 11th, the corporate corruption. We've had the economic downturn, the impending war with Iraq. Are you surprised it's still a 50-50 country? Well, no. I, I, I think that, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think, I think there, I like partisanship. I like people who stand for things and are not afraid to admit it. Uh, and, and I think that the, you know, there's, it, it's the arena of ideas, and I, I like a genuine competition for that. But the, there's been no seismic shift, which is interesting in two years. Well, you can say there hasn't been a seismic shift, but there should have been tonight and wasn't. I mean, just going on tradition, the off-year elections, there should have been, when you throw them all the things you've been asking me about, the economy, as I say, not the greatest thing. They, should, they, they were unable to really capitalize. They only had, I mean, as I say, 34 seats. They only had 14 up, had to win two or three, and they still may. I mean, it, it, it's still early looking at your chart. But the House, I think the Republicans are going to end up gaining seats in the House tonight. This is... Um, this has got to be for Republicans a good night, and I think in the Democratic cloakrooms behind closed doors, there's going to be some serious discussion about right, who's going to lead this party, where are we going to go from, from this day forward, because this does not bode well for them in 2004. Uh, Rush, we're going to look at some numbers that could prove crucial before the night is out. This is Louisiana, where Mary Landro has to get over 50% of the vote right. 
to avoid a runoff. And as you can see, with about 41% of the precincts counted so far, she's a couple of points below that. If that turns out to be the case all night long, given the patterns that we're seeing, we may not know the results of the Senate until December 7th. It's deja vu all over again. Well, where there's some of these races, you know, you look at Minnesota, it's very close. You've got an absentee ballot question there. Uh, I, you know, you, you, you mentioned the partisan split of the country. You know, you, you, you don't know until you ask people uh, what it is that motivates them, gets them out to the polls and so forth. I can tell you from the standpoint of many uh, Republican voters what's happened in New Jersey with election law not mattering. It just simply didn't matter. I mean, just change it. If you've got the judges, change it. It's no big deal. That, that may not have had an impact in New Jersey, but I think it got the Republican vote. I think this rally for, for Mondale, which the supposed memorial for Wellstone, brought out some Republican votes nationwide. And uh, this Mary Landry situation uh, is interesting because, as you've been saying all night, uh, this, this could be where it all turns. Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh, thank you very much. You're going to be with us later tonight as well. I'll we're be here back at one as long as necessary. <laughs> That was said in an engaging, not in a threatening fashion, everyone. That's we're right. we're going to be hearing from Bob Kerry, former United States Senator on the Democratic side, and Richard Gephardt has a lot at stake tonight as well. We'll be hearing from him as well when we come back on election night 2002. From WDSU News Channel 6, this is a Commitment 2002 special. Good evening, I'm Norman Robinson. And I'm Chris Fairbairn. Just to bring you up to date now with the latest numbers in our local elections. That's right, the runoff for Orleans Parish District Attorney is first up. Let's take a look at those numbers, if we can, in the hotly contested race for this, this particular seat, the first time we're going to get a new DA in 30 years. Eddie Jordan with 75% of the precincts reporting, leading Dale Atkins, his opponent, 51 to 49%. And also tonight, the uh, runoff for the... Uh, DA, we're going to go to the Fairmont Hotel, and that's where Eddie Jordan's camp is tonight. WDSU News Channel 6's Richard Angelico is there live. Richie? Norman and Chris, we're uh, here at Eddie Jordan's campaign headquarters, and it's uh, a little closer than most people uh, thought right now. And uh, 51 to 49 percent, and there are some folks getting a little, a little antsy right now. Uh, Franz Zimlich uh, is here with me, my good friend Franz. Franz, you uh, placed uh, fourth in the race and early on through your support behind Eddie. Uh, right now, it's 51 to 49%. It's a little closer right now than you predicted it would be. What's going on you think? Well, we don't know where those precincts are from. Uh, we know one thing. The African-American turnout in New Orleans East is huge. I mean, at quarter after eight, there was huge lines, and uh, we think that's a good thing for us. Do you think, uh, he, where's he going to pick up his strength, do you think? Among, where is he going to pick up his strength among what segment of voters, do you think? Well, we feel positive in all segments. Uh, you know, the story was that we were not going to do any good at all in the white community. We've had nothing but great reception in the white community, especially out in Lakeview. The Algiers turnout was huge. Uh, Uptown has been very, very good, and of course, the Times speaking an endorsed Mr. Jordan, and we think that's going to help him a lot in Lakeview, as well as Uptown. All right. Thank you very much, Franz. Good, good to see you. See you. All right, and Norman and Chris. Thank you. Well, we are here at the Dale Adkins camp. A good crowd here so far. People here are optimistic that the numbers look pretty good. They say that, that although Dale Adkins is not leading, it is a tight race, and they do feel confident that she will pull it off by the end of the night. We spoke with Dale Adkins earlier today. She said she's worked day and night, that she's worked very hard, and she does feel that she'll be able to beat Eddie Jordan tonight. She's had several key endorsements, and one of those endorsements is Pano. We're here now with Lieutenant David Benelli, the president of Pano. How are you guys feeling tonight? You know, we we knew this was going to be a very close race, and, and probably until the last precinct is counted, we'll know who the next DA is. But we're confident that, um, you know, that we're going to have a new DA, and, and we hope it's, it's Dale, but whomever it is, we'll be able to work with that individual. All right, thank you so much for talking to us. Um, there's a sign behind me that says, the best man for the job is a woman, and we'll find out tonight if the voters agree. Back to you. All right, Melanie, thank you. Back in a moment with more Commitment 2002. We'll look at the battle for Mary Landrew's U.S. Senate seat. Our Commitment 2002 coverage continues now with a look at the battle for the United States Senator from Louisiana. Here are the latest numbers with 31% of the precincts reporting. Mary Landrew with 52%. 
Suzanne Hike Terrell with 25%, followed by John Cooksey and Tony Perkins following behind. Right now, we think we have a projected winner from, uh, from Metairie, the U.S. Congressman David Bitter, who's now making his acceptance speech, I would think, his victory speech. Okay, well, we're having some technical problems, but uh, obviously it, it looks like a, a very uh, happy David Vitter at this hour, celebrating with his uh, supporters at his campaign headquarters in Metairie. And that's where we stand at this hour, but the night is still young. Join us for an extended 10 p.m. newscast with the latest returns, live team coverage, and political analysis. For now, I'm Norman Roberts. And I'm Chris Fairburn. We'll see you again in a few minutes. We're back once again with election night 2002. We want to show you the vote that we have it so far in the state of Florida. Almost all of the precincts have been counted so far. A commanding victory for Jeb Bush, who will become the first Republican to be returned to office in that state as governor. Bill McBride, the Democratic novice, with 42 percent of the vote. And we're joined now by Jeb Bush, who joins us from Florida tonight. First of all, congratulations, Governor. Thank you, Tom. What did your brother say to you when he called from the White House? Well, he said he was proud, and I thanked him for his incredible support. Uh, the president's very popular down here. He came here last Saturday night. We had about 11,000 people in Tampa, and it helped motivate the troops, and we had a great turnout. Governor, the Florida voters, like voters across the country, were saying in all the polls that I saw that they were very concerned about the American economy, about health care, about education. Which of those domestic issues do you think your brother should concentrate on and how in the next couple of years? Well, the national uh, economy is weak. Florida's economy is stronger. And, and I think the, it is the proper role of the president to, to focus on creating fertile ground for people to, uh, to create jobs and for working families to do well. Um, I'd just as soon have uh, the education policies be developed by the states. Uh, you have something called Amendment 9, as you well know, on the ballot down in Florida, and that do. would <laughs> cut down on class size. It could be a very expensive proposition. We've got about, what, 88 percent of the vote in so far. It looks like it's going to be very close. If, in fact, Amendment 9 passes, how do you pay for it in the state of Florida? Well, you either have to cut spending or you have to uh, increase taxes, and that's a dilemma that I... Um, that I posed to the people of the state as a candidate, I said I was going to vote no because I didn't want to raise taxes. Uh, I think the economy in the state, in, in the country, is recovering but fragile, and tax increases would hurt the, hurt the recovery. So we'll see what happens if it passes. Uh, but there, it's such a big initiative. It costs billions of dollars that there's really only two alternatives. But it could be a real conundrum, especially for a Bush. I remember another Bush one time who said he would not cut taxes, and then he was forced to. That was your father, obviously. Do you think you well, can I've do said that? Well, I've said that, uh, you know, I have a record of tax cutting that's one of the leading, leading ones in the country, but I've said that we would have to raise taxes because the cuts would have to be so dramatic in environmental programs and in, in programs for the development of disabled, for the needy, that we couldn't do it with cuts alone. Uh, Governor, we've been witness in the last week or so again to the inconsistencies, inconsistencies in American immigration policies. We had a boatload of Haitians arrive here. They were going to be sent back. If Cubans arrive and get on shore, they get to stay. I know that you've said that everybody should be welcome here. Is that going to get worked out? Well, what, I, what I've said is that Haitians should be treated as uh, all other nationalities. And, and I, think, I think that's fair, and I believe it will get worked out. But we don't want to create an, a magnet for people to risk their lives and cross the Straits of Florida and endanger their lives and create huge costs to uh, southern Florida. So there needs to be a proper balance. Finally, Governor, after all your brother did for you in the state of Florida, does he get to borrow your baseball globe whenever he wants to now? <laughs> yeah, he does. All right. He Thanks. sure does. I'm Thanks proud very of much. Him. Thank you very much. Thank and you. again, congratulations. We have another call in the uh, United States Senate. This was not an unexpected. Lindsey Graham, a Republican member of the House running for Strom Thurmond's seat as a senator from the state of South Carolina. He is our projected winner there tonight, Lindsey Graham, going from the House of Representatives. He was one of the impeachment managers against Bill Clinton, one of those who, in fact, survived that assignment. Let's go now to Richard Gephardt, who's the Democratic leader in the United States House of Representatives. And it does appear pretty clear tonight, Congressman, that you're not going to regain control of that chamber. Well, I wouldn't jump to that conclusion yet, Tom. We've got a long way to go. We've had some good races that we didn't expect, frankly, and 
states like Pennsylvania and uh, Maryland and Georgia. We've even got one in Alabama that we didn't expect, so we've had some good surprises. There are other places we haven't done as well as we would have liked. I think you're going to have to wait till you see the West, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona before you can really figure out the House. If you do not gain control, are you prepared to stay as the minority leader of the House? Well, let's get the results. Uh, obviously, uh, you've got to look at, at, at all that, and decisions have to be made. But uh, I want to see the results, and I want to see how we've done in the House. I think we still have a chance to take back the majority in the House, something that our whole caucus has worked so hard on these last two years. However these results turn out, will they affect in any way what is widely seen as your very serious flirtation with running for president again? I, I haven't figured any of that out. I, I, I've been concentrated on winning back the House, and we're still in the hunt tonight. And uh, maybe by morning we'll have a better answer, and then we can uh, go from there. Congressman, a lot of Democrats are surprised that your party was not able to take more advantage of voter concern with education and in the economy and health care issues. In fact, this could be a historic election for the Republicans, maybe for only the third time since the Civil War they're able to gain seats while holding the White House. Well, Tom, that, that remains to be seen. As I said, we have a ways to go. But if, if that were to happen, I think what you've seen in this campaign is a the tremendous influence of special interest money. Uh, we had campaigns where their candidate was uh, backed up by the pharmaceutical companies, by all kinds of special interest. They, they, in some campaigns, were spending $6 million on a House race, and our candidate was uh, hardly able to come up with $2 million. So if we hold ground or gain ground or certainly win back the House, it'll be a real testimony that the people we're, we're able to get through all that special interest money and vote for their own interest for things like health care and jobs and pensions and corporate responsibility, which it were issues in all the campaigns. All right, thank you very much, uh, Richard Gephardt, who's the Democratic leader in the House of Representatives, a longtime congressman from the state of Missouri. We'll be back with more on election 2002, right after this, as we look at Frank Lockner going back to the United States Senate from the state of New Jersey, an unexpected turn in his 78-year-old life. There is other news on this election night. NBC's Andrea Mitchell is reporting that France now has agreed to a compromise resolution against Iraq. The U.S. expects that France will vote in favor of the resolution tomorrow when there is a meeting at the U.N. Security Council. Russia and China expected to abstain. The the, it says that if Iraq fails to comply or blocks inspectors, it would constitute a further material breach of its obligations. That would be reported back to the UN Security Council. Well, it does not authorize unilateral U.S. military action. It would not exclude it, obviously, and the UN Security Council would have very little choice except to move against Iraq. Let's go to NBC's David Gregory now at the White House. Do we expect an acceleration of administration plans against Iraq after the election, David? I think you would, especially if the U.N. resolution goes through uh, armed with that and a resolution from Congress that allows uh, the administration to, to accelerate war plans for the president to refine whatever plans he wants to go forward with. So uh, there's no question that those obstacles will be removed. David, what about some of these races that are still too close to call tonight? What's yeah, that well, it's, it's still early, but there's, there's a lot of confidence uh, at the White House. I've spoken to senior White House officials, also some Republican Party officials. Let's go through, go through some of the races. Minnesota is still very, very early, but there is some a degree of optimism here uh, for Norm Coleman, the way uh, that some of the vote is coming in, uh, apparently uh, looking good with a very small margin coming back. Uh, in Georgia, still a toss-up. Uh, from the White House perspective, but they like uh, Saxby Chambliss, uh, the way he's running in some of the outlying areas uh, in Georgia, even the suburbs around Atlanta. The big question there, whether the Democratic vote will overwhelm him in Atlanta, that's still a big question. In Missouri, again, more optimism about Jim Talent's chances right now, but that race is still uh, close. Uh, also optimism from Republican officials and the White House in Colorado. They like how Wayne Allard is running with uh, uh, still uh, very little uh, of the vote uh, coming in there. South Dakota is an area of concern for the White House, as you see uh, the numbers there. Uh, they don't like how John Thune is running in uh, some areas that should have been bellwethers for them. 
also Arkansas, another area of concern for this White House and for uh, Republican officials. You look at the numbers there, uh, they think it may be gone. Big war room uh, going on in the White House residence right now. The president intensely watching these returns and making phone calls to winners tonight, Tom. All right, thanks very much, NBC. David Gregory, we had been told earlier that the president would go to bed after calling Jeb Bush, but with the Senate at stake, and it really is at stake at this hour, Tim. We're getting down to just a handful of races. It sure is, Tom, and if, in fact, the Republicans are leaning in Georgia and they have a chance to take that seat, that makes it imperative that Democrats capture Arkansas or and Colorado, both. both. Otherwise, we may have the Louisiana December 7th date staring him in the face as a runoff. Or if the Republicans take Georgia and then pe pick off Missouri and Minnesota, Trent Lott is the new majority leader. This is too close to call. And Tom, some other interesting news on the raw vote with 93% in, in Maryland, a state that is two and a half to one Democratic, the Republican Robert Ehrlich is beating Kathleen Kennedy Townsend 53 to 47. Massachusetts, another Democratic state, the Republican Mitt Romney is ahead of Shannon O'Brien by some seven percentage points. Two Democratic states. It's getting to be what John McCain called a Republican breeze, and it's stiffening against the Democrats. But you do have governors in Pennsylvania, Illinois, Michigan, going from Republican to Democrat. The Democrats will point to that. But still, this is disturbing news for, for the members of the Democratic Party, no doubt tonight. All right. Checkerboard country. Uh, Brian Williams, what have you got for us? That evenly split country you've been talking about all night, Tom. We've been polling three days right up until the vote. We're finding the exact same thing. 46% of people say things are headed in the right direction. 45% say they're going down the wrong track. Uh, no surprise, two-thirds of Democrats say things are on the wrong track. 70% of Republicans say they're pleased with the direction. First two big issues are the economy, one in five voters uh, worried about that. Uh, compared that to the last time we asked, only 9% of voters were very worried, but a rising stock market lifts all boats. That was then, this is now. The other issue on everyone's mind is terrorism. They've been told to expect an another attack, after all, by the government. Just think, all the people elected tonight have no idea what they'll be facing. George Bush did not know during the last election that this city would be minus the World Trade Center as we sit here tonight. Tom? So much has changed in the last two years. It certainly has NBC's Brian Williams. But as it now sits tonight, this is going to be a good evening for President George W. Bush because, as we have been saying repeatedly, traditionally, Republicans who are sitting in the White House or Democrats who are sitting in the White House, whatever the power, uh, the party in power, it loses seats in an off-year election. As many as 55, for example, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1942 at the height of the United States involvement in World War II, Tim. In the, the first midterm election for Bill Clinton, the Republicans captured the House and the Senate for the first time in history. The, in, fact, in fact, tonight, if the president gains seats in the House, and the Senate. It will truly be historic. All right. Well, that's where we stand at this hour. We have a reminder for you. We're going to be back tonight after the Tonight Show. It's about then that we should be able to tell you what's going to happen to the United States Senate and have a clearer picture of what's going on in the House of Representatives. And of course, we want to remind you we'll have continuing coverage on MSNBC, CNBC, and constant updates on MSNBC.com. I'm Tom Brokaw for all of my colleagues at NBC News. I'll see you later. From WDSU, this is News Channel 6. Our top story denied all eyes are on Louisiana tonight to see if there will be a runoff in the race for U.S. Senate. Good evening, I'm Chris Fairbairn. And I'm Norman Robinson, Democrat incumbent Mary Landrieu is fighting hard to keep her seat from going into a runoff. Here's a look at the top four runners in the senatorial race. 61% of the precincts reporting at this hour. Mary Landrieu with 49%, Susie Terrell 27%, John Cooksey is following behind at this hour, and Tony Perkins is also bringing up the, uh, the top four with 8%. WDSU News Channel 6 reporter Scott Simmons joins us live from incumbent Senator Mary Landrieu's campaign headquarters. 
Good evening. We're now waiting for Mary Landry to step before the microphones. We're expecting her in the next few seconds, although it looks like right now, for most in all intents and purposes, Ms. Landry is looking at a runoff, at least engaging some of the numbers from the state. Uh, some of the Landry camp numbers say 46% uh, for her, uh, Hike Terrell 26, 14% uh, John Cooksey. Again, those unofficial returns, and certainly the Democrats were hoping to take this outright tonight, but certainly they face an enormous battle from about $3 million in Republican ad money to the behest of really uh, the, all, the, all three Republican oh. candidates setting sights on Mary Landrieu. Mary Landrieu has received some criticism for not going stronger in some of her attack ads and defending against the Republicans. She's already vowed tonight that it'll be a different scene as we go through the second round. They're still counting second round. Before the microphone right now is Rich Masters, as he is now welcoming Mary Landrieu into the stage, being led or uh, followed by U.S. Senator John Bro. Mary Landrieu approaching the stage. They've been upstairs for the better part of the night, gauging returns, being with family and friends, and also checking about 100 precincts to get an honest return. They're looking at 46, 47 percent, and they seem reserved to the fact that they are headed into a runoff. Of course, the biggest concern being just how big a runoff it will be. Louisiana, are you ready to win? Yes. What a great campaign this has been, and I came down to thank you for everything that you've done and that we've done together. We don't have the final numbers. It's very close. It's very close.
excited crowd at the Mary Landrieu campaign headquarters. And keep in mind, though, if Mary Landrieu fails to get 50 plus 1 percent of the vote, it looks like that uh, Susie Terrell could be in a runoff against Landrieu December 7th. WDSU News Channel 6 reporter Helena Moreno joins us live from the Suzanne Hyde Terrell camp in Baton Rouge. Helena. Thank you so much, Norman. Susie Terrell just took the podium, and let's go ahead and listen to what she has to say. They're not the most seasoned, <laughs> but they are the most loyal. And our campaign has reached across Louisiana, and our volunteers have worked tirelessly. Thank you so much. not just about tonight, but where we're going in our future. People in Louisiana have crossed party lines, they've crossed racial lines, and they've heard our message of Louisiana. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think they know one thing about Susie Terrell. When she makes a promise, she keeps a promise. And we're going to take, we're going to take our message across the state. We're going to keep hoping and praying the rest of the night. And I hope you'll stick with us. I tell you what, Louisiana, you are a great place to be, a great state. And I know that we can have a great, great future. So um, all of you all who love our state, and who care about our future, all of you who believe that we have the need for greater opportunities for our children, we welcome you to join us in, their, in our campaign. No one's support will be taken for granted. I'd like to say that um, as we are being optimistic, I would like to thank John Cooksey and Tony Perkins. Two good men who have run good campaigns, and we should thank them tonight for their commitment to our state, their passion for our principles, and their love for our country. If we get to where I think we're going tonight, I look forward to working with John and Tony to win this race for Louisiana. to their sign waivers and volunteers across this state know how important this state is to this race is to our future and I welcome them to join our campaign. We have come so far but we are not done yet. Tomorrow hopefully will only mark the beginning, and I wish Mary Landry good luck, and I look forward to engaging her from Shreveport to Grand Isle, city by city, town by town, person by person. Susie Terrell supporters also very excited about the numbers tonight, and uh, you've been seeing them flash at the bottom of your screen. So right now, uh, I believe Susie Terrell is uh, coming in behind Landry with 27% uh, of the vote. Now, with 75% uh, of the precincts reporting at this hour, about 10 after 10 o'clock, another big race taking place right here in New Orleans. Voters are deciding who will replace longtime DA Harry Connick. Here's a look at those numbers in the Orleans Parish DA's race. Eddie Jordan with 51%, Dale Atkins with 49%, and that is with 89% of the precincts reporting at this hour. Right now, let's go to WDSU News Channel 6 reporter Richard Angelico live at the Jordan camp from the Fairmont Hotel. Richie.
Well, Norman and Chris, it's a little closer than uh, the Jordan people are comfortable with at this point. The Eddie Jordan was supposed to be down here by 10 o'clock and uh, make his way over to the podium by 10.15 or so. But uh, these numbers uh, have him still up in his room. He's working the telephones, talking with advisors, trying to decide whether or not he's going to hold on to that 51% lead or, or is hoping to grow the lead, uh, perhaps if he can. But uh, who knows at this point? Uh, we're just going to have to wait and see. There's an air of cautious optimism here. But I've got to tell you, these people thought the numbers would be a lot heavier in Eddie Jordan's favor. Norman and Chris, back to you. All right. Uh, well, 89% of the uh, precincts reporting a a slim margin at best, a real horse race sure. tonight. All right, WDSU News Channel 6 reporter Melanie Sanders, meantime, she's in the warehouse district at Dale Atkins Camp. What's the mood there tonight, Melanie? Well, everyone's watching, obviously, the numbers coming in. They're watching very, very closely. They say they are optimistic and they're going to be proud of Dale Atkins, regardless of the outcome tonight. Obviously, the people of the outcome of the race. She has always said that she has worked hard day and night and hopefully that all that hard work will pay off. Again, the numbers don't look great for Dale Atkins, but they are going to watch the numbers until obviously there is an outcome before she comes out to make any kind of a speech. Uh, we have a longtime supporter of Dale Atkins. Fred Herman is here to talk to us. Obviously, you guys are still optimistic, but it, no matter what you say, you're going to be proud of Dale Atkins. That's exactly right. We're very proud of Dale. Dale has run a wonderful, wonderful race. She's a great lady, and we're looking forward to seeing the outcome of this race and moving on from there. There's a lot of talk of the Clio Fields ad and how it affected the campaign and if it added some votes for her. How do you think that that came out? She said it wasn't negative, it was a truthful ad. My belief is it was a truthful ad. I know it was a truthful ad. Uh, Clio Fields' uh, issue in this campaign where Mr. Jordan is concerned was something I think the voters had forgotten about. I think it was very important for them to remember, and I think that's why that message was, was brought. All right, Fred Herman, so thank you so much for thank talking you, to us. Thank you very much. Back to you. All right, Melanie Sanders reporting from the Warehouse District, Dale Atkins Campaign Headquarters. And uh, in Metairie, it looks like an easy win for Congressman David Vitter. That's right. The congressman a shoe in tonight with 82% uh, uh, of the vote, as opposed to his closest uh, competitor, Monica Monica, with uh, only 11%. Uh, in fact, uh, Congressman Jefferson is a shoe in as well. WDSU News Channel 6 reporter Ed Reams joins us live from the Vitter camp. That's right, Norman and Chris. At one point this year, Congressman David Vitter was considering a run for the governor's office, but decided that that was not where his love was. He was his family, and he decided that he would stay and run for another term in Congress. Then overwhelming vote, they have sent him back to Washington. Congressman David Vitter is with me now. You said earlier you were honored that you're going back to Washington. Absolutely honored and humbled, particularly at this percentage. It's just overwhelming. I, we got 80 percent two years ago. I didn't think we'd be able to top it, and we may before the night is, is done. So it's uh, very humbling. Mm -hmm. Does Louisiana benefit when we get some seniority, especially in Congress? This will be two terms, two and a half terms you got going here? Sure. Key committees help. I'm on the Appropriations Committee. Other members of the delegation are on key committees. And obviously, as you serve longer, you move up the ranks and can be more effective. So that all of that is helpful. But I don't, I don't think it's the most important thing. The most important thing is, uh, does the person represent the values of the district, the values of his fellow citizens? And I think I do that for the first congressional district. Any issues that you want to tackle during this term, something that you haven't had a lot of time to spend maybe even your prior term? Well, I have been focused on the economy and the recession, but that's job one. Nationally, we have a recession. We need to work out of it. In, in Louisiana, we need to develop and diversify our economy, bring better jobs to our state for our kids' future, and that's uh, job one. Okay. Congressman David Vitter, again, congratulations. Thank you, Thank you again. Uh, again, Congressman Vitter heading back to Washington. Overwhelming vote, 82% of the vote, and uh, we're going to send it back to you. All right. <laughs> Now a look at the Harahan police chief race. And if you'll look at these numbers, John Doyle Jr. was trying to uh, succeed his father, his late father's uh, footsteps and um, continue his his reign as sheriff, yeah, he was uh, police against. chief, that is. And here we have the results now. Peter Dale with 63 percent and John Doyle the third, pardon me, with 37 percent of the vote at this hour. And the statewide voters decided, as you know, on 12 constitutional amendments. Let's see how they're doing. Mm -hmm. The first one you're going to look at is a legislative session change. That's num number two. Um, and let's take a look at those numbers if we can. On the, well, we're just going to tell you all about these amendments <laughs> right here. Okay. Let's tell you. 
The uh, amendment number one first has to do with uh, legislative session changes for fiscal issues. And uh, with 88% of the precincts reporting at this hour, 54% of the voters have voted for Constitutional Amendment 1, and 46% are voting against. And uh, let's look at Constitutional Amendment 2, shall we, to see how the vote for that uh, particular issue is going. With 98% uh, of the precincts reporting, uh, that particular amendment is winning, and th this is known as the Steli Plan, which uh, increases income tax for the, uh, the, the middle class. It's sort of a, an income tax swap, if you will, for the sales tax as well. Now, here is Constitutional Amendment Number 3, which involves state budget adjustments, and uh, as I understand it, that would be taking money from dedicated funds to uh, trim the budget. That would allow for that, and that is passing at this hour 57% to 43%. Boy, you've been keeping up with these amendments. That's pretty good. Well, that one was I've got my cliff notes. <laughs> that was a tough one. The Constitutional Amendment number 4 item on the ballot with 85% of the precincts reporting, that one appears to be winning as well. And number 4 allows the, uh, no-brainer really, allowing the firing of a public employee convicted of a felony. And actually, you know, the reason why I had to take a, a little sheet in with me into the voting booth so I could remember what all these amendments were about in, in short form. Here's amendment number five, and uh, boy, that one is really close with not all of the votes in it this time. But number five would involve property tax exemptions for developers of retirement communities, and that's 50-50 at this point. And this one is really being, being pushed hard by uh, public employees like firefighters and police officers. This is constitutional it's amendment critical. number six. It's a very crucial item for them with 85 percent of the precincts reporting. That appears to be winning by a large margin, and, and this amendment, number six, makes supplemental pay for for police and, and firefighters permanent. That is critical for police and firefighters. Now, amendment number seven is a special property tax assessment for senior citizens. And if you'll look here, with 85% of the precincts reporting, 68% are voting for it and 32% are against it. As for constitutional amendment number eight, this uh, particular uh, amendment will allow higher education investments in the, in the stock market. And with 84% of the precincts reporting, this one appears to be uh, in a dog race. Uh, with 50% for and 50% against at the moment. A lot of amendments to vote on tonight. Amendment number nine deals with Medicaid trust fund investments in the stock market, and that is 51% against and 49% for. And constitutional amendment number nine would create a drought protection. Number 10. Well, number 10, rather, uh, would create a, a drought protection uh, trust fund, and that appears to be winning with 53% uh, for uh, against that appears to be losing rather with 53 percent against and um, 43 47 percent for amendment number 11 has to do with a tax break for offshore drilling rigs and as you can see here uh, most people have voted against that 54 percent to 46 percent and finally amendment number 12 a really strange one uh, this this particular amendment allows the incumbent coroner now in Livingston Parish who is not a medical doctor to run for re-election providing her opponent is uh, um, a a, a medical doctor with 75 percent of the precincts reporting uh, 57 percent of the people in Livingston Parish are saying that they are against that uh, for and uh, only 43 percent are, are it for. is interesting that that people in other parishes would be voting on the Livingston Parish corners situation all right uh, let's go to Alec Gifford now for some analysis on uh, some of the races uh, that we've been following throughout the evening some of the bigger races including uh, Senate and also DA. We'll be getting to Alec and uh, Dr. Silas Lee and Dr. Yeah, Susan there's some shortly. There's some real close races out there that we have yet to discuss, one being a, a, a race for Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals between um, the clerk of criminal court, Edwin Lombard, and Sidney Cates. You've been watching their commercials oh, sure. on television. They have, they have really been going at each Fighting other tooth and nail. Also, the, uh, the, the, the uh, race for a criminal judgeship uh, at criminal district court between the uh, first assistant for Harry Connick, Tim McElroy, and, and, and Daryl Durbany, who is a professor of law from, from Loyola University, who is who's new to the political arena. And at last check, he was, he was leading the veteran McElroy. And it was interesting when Alec Gifford was running his profiles of all the candidates from several of the big races that, uh, that the two of them were profiled. That was an interesting uh, twist on, on seeing their personalities, seeing their issues that they're confronting. And um, so we'll see the outcome of that as well. We will be right back with our continuing coverage of Election Day 2002. But first, here's a look at the uh, 12 proposed constitutional amendments again that we just broke down for you.
Welcome back to our continuing coverage of uh, Commitment 2002. We're going to go out to Melanie Sanders. She's with Dale Atkins, DA candidate uh, at the Holiday Inn in the Warehouse District. Melanie. Dale Atkins has emerged from a hotel room. They have been watching the numbers, obviously, very closely. She has come out. A lot of people here support her, families, friends, people who've endorsed her, coming out here hoping for a victory tonight. Uh, the numbers have looked like she's trailing right now, and she has come out of her hotel room. We're waiting for her to come into the ballroom to talk with the people who have been waiting for, obviously, a couple of hours to hear what she has to say. They said they were going to wait till the very last minute for her to come out to see what the final numbers were. They were remaining optimistic. optimistic. Many of her supporters saying, regardless of the outcome tonight, they were going to be proud of Dale Adkins. She's worked day and night. She said that she's put on some ads. Many of the ads that we saw concerning Cleo Fields and the Edwin Edwards corruption case, um, she says that regardless of the ads and regardless of the polls, she said she w was going to be victorious tonight. She's coming into the ballroom right now, and uh, we'll hear what she has to say. She's walking up. Many people, as you can hear, are cheering her on, proud of her, and we're hoping for a victory tonight. Let's see and hear from Dale Adkins. Good evening. This, this is not a funeral. It's not a wake. We did well. We just came up a little short. But I want to thank all of you. I called Mr. Jordan and I congratulated him on his successful bid to be district attorney. I wished him well as our next district attorney. And I say to all of you, and I say to the public, he is now my district attorney. Yay! I want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you to all of all. One time we had the President of the United States and cabinet members going around the country in very visible roles on the ground over that 72 hours. We had a network of worker bees that were out there like Republicans uh, never have really engaged in in the past. And I think when you couple those two together, the vision of the president captured with the, the hard work and the intensity with what we put on the ground uh, really did facilitate the ultimate victory we had tonight. What about the agenda for the next two years, Senator First? What would be the top two items on your agenda? Well, you know, uh, up until tonight, things have been very partisan, Republican and Democrat, and I can guarantee you, you'll see uh, our majority leader now, or soon to be majority leader, I predict, Trent Lott, really pulling people together to fulfill this agenda, this vision of the President of the United States. There's a stamp of approval by the, um, all across America, and at least all 34 uh, of these races, for this agenda pulling together on the budget, pulling together on uh, tax relief, permanent tax relief, pulling together on energy policy, getting all of these judges, 40% of President Bush's judges are behind a dam. Well, now it's time for that dam to come down and to have those judges to be released into our system. I'll see a lot of pulling together Democrats and Republicans fulfilling or helping fulfill this agenda of President Bush. Do you see any possibility that the tax cut that was passed last year will be altered in any fashion, any parts of it frozen? You know, I think the most immediate thing, the most immediate thing we'll see is looking at Homeland Security, which really has been obstructed in the United States Senate, I believe, inexcusably. I think we'll see the release of these judges, which I think have been obstructed really inexcusably. And I think we'll pass a federal budget to, to give some sort of control to, to federal spending. And I think that's where the, at least the initial focus will be, coupled with what goes on internationally with Iraq and the United Nations. All right, thank you very much, Senator uh, Bill Frist, who was the chairman of the Senate re-election campaign, and he's had a very busy, and now it turns out, a very productive election day. Senator, thank you very much. Good to be with you, Tom. Uh, and his counterpart on the Democratic side is Senator Patty Murray of the state of Washington, and she joins us tonight from Washington, D.C. Senator, what happened to your candidates? Well, we faced an unprecedented amount of money and an unprecedented campaign by a White House and the staff just as uh, my colleague Senator Frist just described to you. Uh, and we were in very Republican states that we were fighting. Uh, we had an uphill battle from the start. And uh, I got to tell you, sitting here right now this time at night, 
we've done well for that kind of machine that was thrown at us. What we do know is we have lost one seat in Georgia and we picked up one seat in Arkansas. We are still counting votes in Missouri and Minnesota and Colorado, South Dakota. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, this Senate is going to be in a majority by one vote, one way, uh, either way. And, uh, and we still have a lot of say about what, uh, what the agenda of this country is going to be. Senator Murray, uh, earlier tonight, Tom Daschle told Jim Avila of NBC News that it's trending Republican, and that he had great concerns you, you were going to lose control of the Senate. Well, clearly, um, the, the news is not real great for us at this point tonight, but we're Democrats. We don't give up. Uh, when you said earlier that you had the uh, daunting task of running in Republican states, in fact, there were 34 seats up. 20 of them were Republican. Uh, that's correct. And in, in Republican-leaning states, all of them. So we knew we had an uphill battle to begin with, and I think that uh, it, it played out tonight. What happens next Monday for the Democrats? Well, I think clearly for Democrats, uh, we are going to continue to fight for the issues we care about. We ran this election saying the economy is the number one issue out there. Jobs, getting education, training for our uh, workers that are out of work, unemployment insurance. We're not giving up on these issues. These are things we care deeply about and believe this country uh, needs us fighting for, and we will continue to do that. All right. Thank you very much, Senator uh, Patty Murray of the state of Washington. Still counting the votes tonight in Missouri, South Dakota, and Minnesota. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Tim, they do have a daunting task. And, but the fact is that if the Republicans do get control of the Senate, it will be just by one or two votes. But nonetheless, that's enough to get their judges through and most of their legislation through as they learn when they lost one vote when Jim Jeffords went from being a Republican to an independent and siding with the Democrats. There'll be an awful lot of pressure on Senator Lincoln Chafee, the Republican from Rhode Island, who Democrats are hopeful will one day want to become a Democrat. Look for them to make a concerted effort to try to pull him over, as they did Jim Jeffords. He's been but pretty explicit about saying he wouldn't do he that, He has however. said he wants to stay a Republican. Right. Absolutely. His father was a famous old moderate Republican, and it's uh, deep in his bones, I think. Senator Murray said the votes are still outstanding, and they are, Tom, but let's just look at this. The Democrats wanted to capture these four seats. They captured one, just Arkansas. That moves to the Democratic column. In the Democratic side, the Republicans have captured Georgia, South Dakota, Missouri, Minnesota, all outstanding. If the Republicans captured just one of those, they will take control of the U.S. Senate. If by chance the Democrats hang on to those three seats, then Louisiana on December 7th becomes a major battleground and the Democrats must win that runoff in order to maintain control of the Senate. The odds are deeply stacked against the Democrats as we talk tonight. Tim, we're going to show you the makeup of the United States Senate at this hour. Now, there are still four uh, races to be decided, as you can see. Republicans have 49, Democrats 46, and Independents 1. Uh, now, Jesse Ventura has appointed an independent to the Senate, but there's some question about whether or not he'll be able to take office if Norm Coleman wins tonight. He may get certified right away as the winner and replace Paul Wellstone. They're still sorting through the election laws out there in uh, the state of Minnesota. So there are a lot of things up for grabs, but the big picture is that it does appear very, very likely that the Republicans will have at least one, perhaps as many as two votes. Uh, in the United States Senate. And remember when the Senate was 50-50 and Dick Cheney cast the deciding vote making Trent Lott the uh, majority leader, there was a power sharing agreement entered into by the Democrats and Republicans for dividing up the committees but having one party, in this case the Republicans, as the chairman. All right. All right. We'll be back with more. We're going to have a conversation with Rush Limbaugh, among others, when we continue on election night 2002 here on NBC. That's 30 Rockefeller Plaza in New York. This is the nation's capital. And tonight, it's a town that belongs to President George W. Bush after campaigning strenuously in 15 states, I think, altogether, and raising well over $100 million for Republican candidates. It paid off, as Dick Cheney might say, big time. Tonight, it appears very likely the Republicans will have control of the United States Senate and expand their base in the U.S. House to go with the power that they already have in the White House. One of the races that concerned him greatly was in the state of Colorado, where they had a Republican incumbent, Wayne Allard, running against Tom Strickland, a former U.S. attorney. This was a rematch. 
uh, Strickland, by Republican and Democratic accounts alike, was closing fast, but not fast enough based on the vote that we're seeing so far. We have projected Wayne Allard will be returning to the uh, nation's capital as a Republican senator. Three-fourths of the precincts have been counted in the state of Colorado, which has a very popular uh, Republican governor out there as well, elected tonight, Governor Bill Owens. And there is Senator Allard right now. Senator Allard, congratulations. Thank you very much, Tom. It's good to be with you this evening. Uh, no one in the country had a tougher race than you did. What were you think? What were, what were the issues that separated you from Tom Strickland in the closing hours, in your judgment? Well, I think there's a number of issues that separated us. Uh, number one, uh, it was this talking about the security of the country. I felt like we would have peace, should have uh, peace through strength. Um, I differed with him on the issues of a broad-based tax cut, uh, differed with him on uh, water on the western slope. You know, Colorado's impacted by uh, a severe drought here, and differed on him uh, on local control versus more mandates uh, from Washington. What's going to be your number one priority when you get back to Washington, and if, as expected, the Republicans have a majority in the Senate? Well, my number uh, one priority would be to continue to work with this Republican president to continue to build up our defenses so that we can be more secure. We don't have to worry as much about terrorism. Senator, there was almost no talk at all in this campaign about the need for energy conservation or new sources beyond drilling in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. Do you think that that will be an issue in the next two years? I think that uh, energy will again be an issue in three or four years. Uh, Experts tell me that we're headed for another energy shortage crisis, and we need to be addressing this issue. I'm disappointed that in this session we didn't get an energy plan passed for the United States. Uh, I will support a broad-based energy plan that would include ener renewable energy All and right. conservation. Thank you very much, Senator Wayne Allard. Again, congratulations you. on your re-election tonight. Very Thank tough you. race out there in Colorado. Let's go to NBC's Brian Williams now in New York, who's been watching the governor's races for us and why people voted the way they did in some of those uh, races, Brian. And Tom, let's whip around the nation, beginning in Arkansas, a tight one. The GOP wanted it, they got it. Mike Huckabee will be holding that seat. Granholm in Michigan, as you mentioned, possible national figure someday for the Democrats. A big name there, John Engler, is gone, term limited. Slave reparations came up in this campaign. It was a weird one. Kemp Thorne in Idaho. The projected winner there, Sibelius, rather. Uh, Democrats take an open seat in Kansas for governor. Vilsack, popular Democrat in Iowa, GOP wanted that one. Texas, GOP wanted and got Rick Perry in the state house there. Mike Rounds, we already announced in South Dakota. Rhode Island, where politics is, shall we say, always interesting. Don Carcieri, the Republican winner there. Governor South Carolina, Mark Sanford, something of an upset over Jim Hodges. And in New York tonight, where a Cuomo could not win and a Clinton could not help this year, even if he was a former president, uh, Pataki was unbeatable after what he did for the state post 9-11. You have to wonder here in New York about the other Clinton. As you know, a lot of Supreme Court justices like being in the minority because they can make more noise, and Senator Clinton now becomes a very vocal member of that uh, perhaps minority Democratic Party in the Senate. Tom? All right. Uh, thank you very much, NBC's Brian Williams. Uh, we'll tell you that uh, we have an unusual situation developing in Oklahoma. They now say that they've counted 100 percent of the precincts so far, but they've got a dead heat. Uh, Steve Largent, obviously an old NFL star and a Republican member of Congress, was hoping to capture the Republican uh, State House. Frank Keating had been the governor out there, but Steve Largent in a very, very tight race. Hard to imagine one that's tighter than that at this hour. We haven't gotten a return from uh, San Francisco yet, Tim. District 8 in the San Francisco Valley running for a county supervisor. The candidate's name is simply Starchild, listed as an exotic dancer and escort. We probably won't have that before we're off the air. But if we do, we'll get back to you. This is Election Night on NBC.
very happy president of the United States and I with the two <laughs> men who will be leading it. Uh, now appears very likely the two chambers of the Congress. That's Dennis Hastert on the left, who has been the speaker. Trent Lott, who lost his job as the Senate Majority Leader and very likely will get it back. The president staying up later than usual. He was going to just stay up and congratulate his brother Jeb Bush, who had been reelected as governor of Florida. But things were turning out so well for him that he hung around for a while in the living quarters of the White House and had a number of friends in. Let's show you the race in California for governor. This is uh, more than a bit of a surprise at this hour. 28 percent of the precincts have been counted so far. Bill Simon has a one point lead over Gray Davis. That would be a stunning upset. You'd have to say it would be the upset of the year in American politics. Bill Simon had been trailing Gray Davis, who was not personally popular even in his own party. But he had a war chest of $60 million, and he used it like a warrior against Bill Simon, who was running for office the first time and stumbled on any number of occasions. So we'll wait and see how that one turns out. We don't know where all those votes are coming in from. Uh, California, a lot of Democratic votes in the northern part of the state. You generally tend to get the votes at the beginning from the southern, more conservative part of the state. Uh, joining us now is Rush Limbaugh. We're pleased to have you with us tonight. Thank Rush, you. Uh, we were saying earlier tonight it looked like a Republican breeze. It's now become a warm gale pushing the uh, Republicans uh, right. into office and the Democrats out. It is. It is. But don't forget now, there are a lot of situations where uh, in Minnesota there's a possible lawsuit waiting with the absentee ballots, disenfranchised, and how close it is. Missouri, it's 22,000 votes last time I looked. Uh, any number of things. Democrats don't give up. You know, they don't give up easily. Last and, time I checked, Republicans didn't either. Yeah, well, they, 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 <laughs> you know, I heard I heard something earlier tonight. I was I've been watching you guys uh, uh, backstage, and you I, I saw Carville too uh, hiding behind a trash can when I said, uh, and I, he he was upset because the Democrats ran a Me Too campaign. I would like to respectfully disagree with that. I think this Me Too campaign was a piggyback effort at the last minute, but all year last two years actually since George Bush was elected they said he was an illegitimate president they said Florida is payback time we there's a lot of anger down there and Terry McAuliffe staked his personal reputation on it I think they've been opposing George W Bush ever since he was inaugurated they've tried it on every issue they even tried separation on the war on terrorism for a while and it backfired on them the, their their me too ism is a result of not standing for anything, or at least not being honest about what they stand for, not willing to tell people what they want, and they ran a negative campaign trying to get people upset to vote against Republicans. And when they say, well, we didn't stand for anything, I think they did. I think the face of the Democratic Party has been Tom Daschle and, and uh, McAuliffe, and it's been entirely negative uh, against a very popular president. And I think the tactics in the last two weeks, well, as I said earlier, in New Jersey and what happened in Minneapolis, I think is just a both of them are little microcosms of the entire two years of the Bush administration up till now, the way the Democrats have played it. And they're going to have to get their act together. Republicans just have to keep doing what they were doing. They're going to formalize tax cuts, maybe accelerate them permanent, uh, make them permanent, uh, try to fix the public education system. They ran on issues, and it works every time it's tried. Are you not at all concerned about the size of the deficit and what's likely to happen in the next three years, especially if we have a war against Iraq, which is going to be a very expensive problem? Well, I remember during the 80s, the deficit was a big monster that was going to destroy us, and it didn't. Uh, we ended up, if we, if we would accelerate a tax cut, the deficit would end. We'll, we'll end that with economic growth, and I think it's what the president is trying to do, combine, you know, the, you look at the sniper situation that, that plagued this area. People were afraid to go out, grocery stores were empty, commerce came to a screeching halt. The issue of security and the economy are linked. War on terrorism is a security issue. You get that fixed and the economy is going to come back with it. That'll cause tax revenues to come back up and the deficit will go back down. Economic growth works every time it's tried, but it doesn't work if you raise taxes. And that was the Democrats' answer. It didn't work. It's not going to work in the future. I, I think that the, the economic circumstance will take care of itself. The growth rate's starting to come back up. And if the president will now proceed with vigor, on his domestic agenda, not just the judges, but accelerating this tax cut, the deficit will dwindle. Is there not a risk that if the Republicans control the White House, the House and the Senate, and the Democrats effectively try to be a party in opposition, the American public will say the Republicans had control and couldn't get results? Yeah, you know, there's, there's, there's no question there's that risk. And now you're getting, there are factions in the Republican Party, too. You've got, you've got moderates in the Republican Party, House especially. 
So the idea that there's a monolithic Republican Party that's going to ram all this stuff through is a myth, too. It's going to take a lot of work on the part of the president to keep his own party unified uh, when they're in power. But the, um, I think the ace in the hole, the Democrats are going to have no choice but them to be opposed now. That's, they've got to stake out that ground for the 2004 race. And it's, um, I, I, think, I think it's a great opportunity if these results hold up as they're projected to tonight. It's, it's a great opportunity. And if they can show in two years that they deserve leadership, then they'll, they'll have it uh, reaffirmed in 2004. If they don't show that they deserve it, the Democrats will triumph again. So it's an opportunity, but they've got to keep doing what they do, which is stand for what they stand for and not be afraid to say so. I remember in 1994, you and Bill Bennett, on a C-SPAN walk, I watched you on a Saturday night yeah. when you were over in Maryland, and you were talking to the freshmen. Republicans who were coming and giving them advice yeah. on how they should behave. What would you be telling them this time? Don't gloat. I'll tell you what went wrong in 1994. The Republicans thought the country had turned conservative. They thought that's what the election meant. And so they were a little arrogant about their victory and they assumed that they represented a majority of the Americans. And there were a lot of things that went into that race that really had not everything to do with ideology. And they stopped defining themselves. They stopped explaining who conservatives are and what conservatism is. Uh, I think they don't gloat, do not act like this is a permanent victory of any kind. Take it for what it is, try to analyze it correctly, and just keep standing for what they stand for. And this new tone thing, you know, I was an original critic of it, but I think it's worked. Rush Limbaugh, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. Great. Thank you so Great. much. Great. We'll be back with more on Election Night 2002, right after this. We're back on election night 2002, a night in which it appears very likely that the Republicans will gain control of the United States Senate, but there are outstanding races and they're very tight indeed in some cases. We want to take you through the raw vote total now. In the state of Missouri, 95% of the precincts have been counted so far. Gene Carnahan is the Democratic incumbent, and look at that, about uh, 25,000 votes separating her from Jim Talent, the Republican congressman who is challenging her for that seat. In Minnesota, uh, they're taking longer because they have to count the ballots by hand. Fritz Mondale was a late addition to that ticket, obviously. And with 31% uh, of the precincts counted so far, uh, you can see that the difference between them is about 25,000 votes there as well, 52 to 45 in the percentages. Yeah. John Thune and Tim Johnson in South Dakota. Johnson has now slipped to second place as they move into the western part of the state, which is heavily Republican. As the returns come in there, it looks better and better for John Thune, who was effectively a statewide uh, office holder. He was the only congressman in the state. That would be a big blow to Tom Daschle, who'd been out there campaigning hard for him. Louisiana, 98% of the precincts counted so far. Mary Landro, the Democratic incumbent, has to have more than 50% of the vote to avoid a runoff. It seems very unlikely that she'll get that high, probably statistically impossible. That means December 7th, between now and then, a lot of money, a lot of consultants, but probably not control of the Senate, because it seems likely, Tim, that the Republicans can get there without Mary Landro. All they have to do is win South Dakota or Missouri or Minnesota, right. one of the three. Right. You know, Tom, I've been thinking about how Norm Coleman and John Thune were recruited by this White House to run for these races, planned events. Walter Mondale, behind tonight in this popular vote, largely because of the memorial service that turned into a political rally, an unplanned political event. You can never know what's going to happen in politics. As we've been talking all night about the governors, Brian Williams reports, the conventional wisdom being the Democrats now have governors in Pennsylvania, in Michigan, and in Illinois. That'll be great for 2004. Well, all those states had Republican governors in 2000, and Al Gore won those right, states. Right, right. Jeb Bush gets reelected, and what does he say to you? If, if Amendment 9 passes for cl reducing class size, he has to cut programs or raise taxes. How popular will that be in 2004 when his brother wants to run for re-election? You just never know. 
Well, one of the reasons that uh, American politics is so fluid these days is that there's just so little party loyalty. We see it in Washington because the people who get here run on a party ticket. But as you move across the country, you find people like Paul Volcker who said, I used to be a Democrat, but I don't know what I am now. And I think that there's more and more of that across the country. And when Rush Limbaugh says Republicans are not monolithic right. and they shouldn't gloat, that's pretty interesting advice coming from a man who was very much part of the New Gingrich Republican Revolution. Mm -hmm. All right, well, this has been a fascinating night so far, and it's going to continue. We want to say to those of you who are joining us now, well, we'll we want to welcome those of you who are joining us now, uh, many of you from the mountain states. Uh, this is a very exciting election night, depending, obviously, on which side of the partisan ledger you fall. It's either disappointing or triumphant. It appears that it's going to be a very big night for President George W. Bush, who spent the last two weeks campaigning hard around the country. He was criticized by the Democrats. But now, tonight, the Democrats are on the losing side in the House, it appears, and also on the Senate. This is a triumphant pickup for the president, who came into office with a 50-50 Senate, then lost one of the senators and lost control of that. Tonight, it appears very likely that he will regain it. Uh, David Gregory is at the White House now, where Obviously, the lights have been burning late and happily. David? Yeah, indeed, Tom. The president just went to bed, we're told, just uh, a few minutes ago. He was supposed to go to bed at 9.30 Eastern time, but he was burning up the phone lines. He was uh, pretty pumped up and had a lot of congratulatory phone calls uh, to offer around the country. Uh, Tom, Tim mentioned the political operation out of this White House, recruiting candidates in South Dakota and Minnesota. I've spoken tonight to senior White House officials who say, look, after the election in 2000, we made a concerted effort to build up the Republican organization across the country. One of the big trends they see tonight, grassroots organizations enacting, implementing what they call the 72-hour plan, which is making sure that these local campaigns get in touch with voters starting at 72 hours before Election Day, beefing up door-to-door -door efforts phone banks, all of those things that drive out turnout. You add to that the fact that the president had such an aggressive schedule to turn out the vote. He traveled to key battlegrounds, and it made uh, an important difference. There's another big story, of course, tonight, Tom, that doesn't have to do with the election, and that is that Harvey Pitt, the Security and Exchange Commission chairman, has resigned. This is the first high-profile resignation in this administration. He was the embattled head of the SEC, and he's gone tonight. And uh, David Gregory, any talk about who may succeed Harvey Pitt? That's obviously going to be a key position to fill. It absolutely will. No talk about that yet, Tom, uh, but it may be just the beginning of part of an economic uh, change uh, in the team in the White House as well. All right, thanks. David Gregory at the White House, back with more on Election Night 2002 after this. We're back in election night 2002. This was the year once again of women running for not just the state houses but also for the United States Senate. That got overlooked a little bit. 11 ran for the Senate. And look at this uh, 10 candidates for in nine states for the state house. And tonight in Michigan, we know that one of them has already been elected. And Janet Napolitano was one of the prominent women who was running in the state of Arizona, although we've not been able to project. In your race yet, uh, Ms. Napolitano, we know that you're running a very strong race out there. Why do you think women yeah, are so... Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, we're, we're up, and the, and the uncounted votes are largely Democratic votes, so we're feeling very good right now. And why do you think women have done so well in the races for the State House? I, I think the women who were running for the state, for the governorships, w were known quantities. Jennifer Granholm's an attorney general, I'm an attorney general, Catherine Sebelius is an insurance commissioner, and on, onward. We, we're not flashes in the pan. We've been working towards these jobs for a great many years. Are we beyond gender politics at this point so people don't say, well, she's a woman governor or he's a guy governor? I certainly hope so. Maybe this will be the last time we have an interview like this. But in Arizona, should I win, and it looks like I will, I think we'll be the first state to have a woman governor succeed a woman governor. So clearly in Arizona, we're through the gender issue. And is it easier to run as a woman in the West, do you think, than it is in the East? 
You, you know, one, one would think so. If you look at the percentages of, in the legislatures and so forth, the Western states tend to be better for women candidates, and I have no, no, no idea why, but that's just the way it is. Well, I think it may have something to do with the ranching and farming tradition. Everybody has to work side by side, both uh, out in the country well, and in the small towns. Uh, maybe that's it, but uh, I'll tell you, when I was elected Attorney General four years ago, every statewide office holder elected that year was a woman from governor on down. So Arizona's really been leading the, l leading the path. All right. Thanks very much, Janet Napolitano, tonight. Although we've not, we've not projected you as a winner yet, obviously you're uh, running a very strong race there in Arizona. Thank you. Uh, we want to show uh, Jeb Bush is the winner in uh, the state of Florida tonight. We're going through some of the governors now. There he is. And he's... I'm so lucky to have a great first lady in my life, Columba. She's a great first lady for the state of Florida. To have my family here this special night means a whole lot to me. George and Jeb, thank you. Jeb Bush, coming. earlier tonight, he had his mother and father down there. He paid tribute to his uh, thank you. brother, George W. Bush. Thousands, For a long time, it was thought that this was the most effective politician in the Bush family. Sure we but his brother had to come down there and carry him around on his shoulders a little bit, Tim Russert. Uh, and in fact, uh, it was quite genuine tonight when we had Jeb Bush on earlier thanking his brother and how proud he was of him. He even said that he could borrow his baseball glove any time that he wanted to. The president made a dozen trips to Florida, Tom, to help his brother out. Terry McAuliffe, the chairman of the Democratic Party, made this the number one race. Mr. McAuliffe's father-in-law was the treasurer for Bill McBride, the Democratic candidate. Right. As recently as Sunday, Terry McAuliffe said, we are going to beat Jeb Bush. One other interesting point, the new governor of Michigan, Jennifer Granholm, the attorney general, widely touted as a potential national figure. One problem, she was born in Canada. She could never run for president or vice president. <laughs> That's true. Let's uh, go to Carrie Sanders now down in Florida and see how they did with their uh, voting procedures this time. Carrie, did it go okay? Well, it worked. And uh, in 2000, you know, this was the beginning of a very long wait to see who had won the race for president. Here, two years later, and more than $50 million. And boy, what a difference. The system worked. Much of that money spent on the new technology, the touchscreen computers, and other high-tech voting equipment that's used to make this work and all come together. Also, I think it's important to note is that they also instituted some new rules in Florida that allow for early voting. And in some urban counties, upwards of 20% of the people who went to the polls went up to 15 days early and voted. And that made for a much smoother election. And finally, the police were involved in some counties. This was called in after eight weeks ago during the primaries where there was yet one more meltdown. They went into a crisis mode. The police were called in to help. And tonight we saw police coming in with the ballots, all of them coming in, all of the, all of the polling locations opened on time and closed on time. And that's really a significant development for Florida, as you well know, Tom. Thank you very much, Kerry Sanders. Indeed, I think that they're relieved on a couple of accounts in the Republican Party there that they did get the votes counted and they got their governor back into office. Let's go to California now and someone who's a rising star on the California political scene. He's already been a star for a long time on the big screen, and that's Arnold Schwarzenegger, who has Proposition 49 on the ballot out there. He wants to get more help for youngsters in after-school programs. I'm not going to pretend we don't know each other, Arnold, so I'll just call you by your first name. How's your proposition doing so far? Uh, everything is going really terrific, uh, Tom and Tim. Uh, it looks like we are more than 10 points ahead right now with uh, half of the votes in. Uh, so everything looks really great, and I'm very happy that all the hard work paid off. And I think that California would, in fact, be the first state that would have comprehensive after-school programs. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. A lot of people see this as just a stepping stone for Arnold Schwarzenegger so that he can run for governor of California. Is that your plan? Well, I know a lot of people have been asking me about that, but the reality of it is, is for me, the important thing is now to win this and then to go and uh, implement the programs. And this will take a lot of time and a lot of hard effort and work. And this is what I'm going to do next. So I'm not going to concentrate on running for office or anything like that. I'm con concentrating mainly on just implementing this program and th I'm thinking about the children right now and not about myself, what I'm going to do. It's no secret, of course, that you're married to our own Maria Shriver, who's a member of the Kennedy family, all of them registered Democrats. You've made no secret of your Republican inclinations. 
do they try to draw you across the line into their party? No, not at all. They know that I, I, I'm, uh, I cannot be persuaded. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, there are so many things that uh, Democrats and Republicans have in common. I concentrate much more on the things that we can do together rather than dividing the part, uh, everything always. Uh, this Proposition 49 was a perfect example of that, how we brought the Democrats and the Republicans together and we formed one of the most powerful coalitions because we reached out and made it a bipartisan issue and rather than dividing people. So we are successful because of that and I think that's the way we should move forward. We always think about what can we do together, what do we have in common rather than always, you know, uh, nitpicking and fighting over things. Arnold, thank you very much, and congratulations if these numbers hold Absolutely. up. And you do win because I know you invested a lot of your own personal time to say nothing of a few of your dollars as well in this effort. And uh, it is going to be a welcome, I know, in California. Well, thank you very much to both of you. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a look at those California governor numbers again because we were a little uh, stunned by them earlier. 45% of the vote has been counted so far. And now uh, Gray Davis has moved into a lead. What likely happened is that they got the early returns from Southern California, the Orange County area, which is more conservative. That's often the pattern there. Then as they move north into San Francisco and the more liberal areas, then uh, Gray Davis will uh, do better. But if he finishes just two or three points ahead of Bill Simon, that will be stunning news because Bill Simon was called, even by Republicans back here in Washington, the worst campaigner that they had in the nation. Uh, Gray Davis was running as an incumbent with $60 million in the bank. He was not a very popular figure in his own party. And for Bill Simon to run this kind of a race against him, not good news for uh, Gray Davis. Tom, the two major candidates for governor for California had negative ratings over 50 percent. <laughs> but someone had to win. Right. And watching Arnold Schwarzenegger talk about his political future, I began to think, could an actor ever be elected governor of California? <laughs> yeah, I, rem I was there for the first one in 1966. They were asking the same question. But he can't run for president either. He was born in Austria. He was born in Austria, right. We're going to be back in just a moment with Charlie Cook, who is one of the great political gurus in this country, talking about these races that are still too close to call. Can't award the Senate to the Republicans yet. It's looking very favorable for them, and we'll hear from Charlie in a moment. We're back now. We still have three outstanding Senate races that will determine who has control of the United States Senate in the next term in Missouri. Almost all the votes have been counted so far. As you can see, we've got under 30,000 votes, it looks to me, in my quick math there, uh, separating Gene Carnahan, who's the Democratic incumbent, from Jim Talent. She has not yet conceded, and with good reason, looking at the raw numbers. Let's also take a look at what's going on in Minnesota. A slower count there because of the hand count of the ballots. Uh, Fritz Mondale was added to those ballots after he replaced Paul Wellstone. So there are five points separating the two of them in raw vote, 26,000 votes altogether. In South Dakota, John Thune now has eased into the lead with 81% of the votes counted thus far. Uh, he has a lead of about 1,000 votes. Uh, Tim Johnson beat Larry Pressler by just 8,600 votes. But what's happening now in South Dakota is that you're moving into the western part of the state these are sparsely populated counties, but they are heavily Republican, where John Thune, he's a native of that area, Murdo, South Dakota, and he is likely to be much more popular uh, than Tim Johnson. Charlie Cook is our political guru and wizard here. He's a publisher of a widely read newsletter. Uh, we've been saying all night long here, uh, Charlie, that it's looking good for the Republicans, but we can't hand it off to them at this point because those races could go the other way. You're right. I mean, we've got Democ Senate Democrats are walking on the edge of a cliff, but they haven't fallen over yet. Uh, the talent race in Missouri, or talent over Carnahan, you know, he looks like he's going to win, but it's still, it's not there yet. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't quite give it to him then. In the House, it's still, I mean, I don't think Democrats can win control of the House, but they still could pick up a couple of seats here. And uh, you've had three uh, uh, Republican incumbents in the House already lose, only one Democratic incumbent's lost. You know, in the governorships, uh, you know, you are going to see Democrats pick up some. So, you know, this is going to be a good night by historical uh, perspective for Republicans. But, you know, I don't think, uh, it, it, you know, this isn't a landslide or anything. What does it tell you about the country, Charlie? Split down the middle. I mean, you're going to see these governors roughly 25-25, the Senate, you know, 51-49, uh, something like that, and the House 
you know, probably 51 percent, 49 percent. So uh, not much a change. Uh, One billion dollars will be spent and not much will change. But what will change if the Republicans take control of the Senate, for example, we've talked about this at length tonight, is that the president will get his judges before the Senate Judiciary Committee and probably confirmed. And that's a big change. And they'll get to set, yes, that's absolutely right. And they'll get to set the agenda, you know, control the hearings, that sort of thing. But in terms of having the oomph to, to, to push legislation through the Senate, uh, gosh, you've got to have a lot closer to 60 votes than uh, 50 or 51. And, Charlie, what happens in terms of uh, how this is likely to affect how the president positions himself for 2004? What are the danger signs for him? Well, the problem is that, that these midterm elections are just absolutely no use whatsoever uh, in terms of predicting how presidents do uh, two years later. I mean, you look at President Clinton with that disaster in 1994. Uh, I mean, you, it's, it's, it's really not a good barometer at all. All right. Thank you very much, Charlie Take Cook. Care. A cautionary note, we still have those outstanding races in Minnesota, Missouri, and South Dakota, and they are very close, but if the Republicans can pick up just one of them, uh, they'll be in good shape here before the end of the night. That does not mean that there has been a big mandate that has been laid on the president, although he certainly did have a personal stake in this campaign. Let's go to NBC's Brian Williams now, who's keeping track of the governor's races around the country and also why some of the people voted the way they did, Brian. And Tom, the voters continue to have a funny way of putting their stamp on their states. In Massachusetts, the home of Ted Kennedy, they have also shown tonight in our apparent winner, Mitt Romney, that they want a Mormon Republican governor. He came to prominence, of course, running the Salt Lake Olympics. And Mitt Romney, it looks like tonight, is headed to victory there. However, we won't have an answer tonight in Vermont way too close and out in oklahoma as you mentioned uh the election that uh, features the former uh, nfl wide receiver tight as a drum tonight in the steve largent election in oklahoma we won't have an answer there where's the issue where is the anger tonight according to our three-day nbc news poll 46 percent of the people say things are going in the right direction 45 percent say things are seriously off on the wrong track it is a split nation voters ratings of the state of the economy are as low as they were back in 94 the year of the angry republican revolution they hit bill clinton in the off-year election so hard back then he was forced to call himself relevant the next morning and call the presidency relevant you mentioned they hit roosevelt in 42 to the tune of 45 seats in the house so we aren't seeing that kind of anger directed against this president at least not on the economy tonight quite the contrary tom all right thanks very much nbc's brian williams uh, Tim Russett has just told me that whoever is the new majority leader will be on Meet the Press on Sunday. You have exclusive interviews lined up with Trent Lott and with Tom Daschle. Who will go first? That's the question. <laughs> we'll know tomorrow morning, I would hope. One of the things I think is going to be interesting in the next two years, Tim, is the tone of business in this town. Wherever I went across the country, Republicans and Democrats alike, however ardent they were about their parties, and I'm so fed up with bickering, I'm so fed up with these negative ads. Now, we know that they move people, but I think the message that is being sent here in that we have a kind of 50-50 nation is get together, figure out how we're going to get through this more complex time that we're all dealing with. Will either party be willing to surrender the issue to achieve a result? Compromise on prescription drugs or save the issue? Compromise, they both understand that Social Security and Medicare needs a long-term fix. Mm -hmm. But they want the issue so desperately for the 2004 campaign, will they be able to compromise? It's an open question, and I don't know the answer. I don't think they do. Well, stay tuned. We'll have continuing coverage, of course, on NBC. Every election night has surprises. This one had many. Still more to come, perhaps. For all of us at NBC News, good night, and thanks for joining us.